Hello everyone and welcome to Wargaming on the Kitchen Table. My name is Ligon and this is the first episode in a series where I will introduce you some ways to engage in the tabletop wargaming hobby in a versatile, storable, and affordable way. I've been playing tabletop war games for about 15 years and I've realized that most of the games on the market are optimized for large armies of large models with large pieces of terrain and played on large gaming tables, which is fantastic. But if you don't have a friendly local gaming store, or if you move around a lot, and you don't have a lot of space in your home to set up and store and play these games, you don't really get to enjoy the full benefit. So in response, I've kept my eye out for miniature games that are made to be played on your average kitchen table. Uh, I have looked for ways to make affordable, durable, and somewhat modular terrain uh, for tabletop gaming so you can enjoy playing your game on a fairly nice kitchen table, uh, but it'll store away easily in your closet and you don't have to worry about it being damaged when it's moved around or if you throw a coat on top of it. I've also looked into different games that can be played in half scale, which is an effective solution for having limited gaming space. There are also another, uh, a number of other benefits of this as well, but I'll address them uh, when we get to them later. Uh, because today I'm going to be talking to you about a family of games called Song of Blade and Heroes. These games are written, edited, designed, or inspired by Andrew Sefiligoy, who is a game designer, that will allow you to use any miniatures you wish on any bases and at any scale. The games uh, use a very basic system, uh, which I'll get to later, but it's been very successful, and there are versions in the game that of the game that covers a staggering amount of themes and genres. So first you have the namesake game, which is Songs of Blade and Heroes, which is a fantasy skirmish game. There are a number of expansions to this game for campaign play, uh, building a home base to operate out of, and to do dungeon crawls. Then you also have Advanced Songs of Blade and Heroes, which has a more robust magic system, and it does more to detail the effects of different types of weapons with a little bit more fidelity. If fantasy isn't really your thing, there are a number of historical options. There's Flashing Steel, which is for Renaissance and Enlightenment era swashbuckling skirmishes with rapiers, back swords, and black powder weapons. And moving forward in time, you have Song of Drums and Tomahawks, which is for the French and Indian War skirmishes. Um, I say French and Indian War because it focuses just on the North American part of the conflict, not the rest of the Seven Years' War. Um, the cool thing about this one is the rulebook actually comes for uh, stat lines for the characters of The Last of the Mohicans. Moving forward again, you have Song of Drums and Tomahawks, excuse me, Songs of Drums and Shakos for Napoleonics, and then you also have 6165, which is for the American Civil War. Then, a little bit closer to the present, you have Flying Lead, which is for skirmishes using modern-day firearms. Uh, this will let you play firefights in World War II in Vietnam, and then it can also let you do play cops and robbers uh, kind of games, or mafia, or pulpy spy games. So you have a lot of versatility with that. If you like guns, but science fiction is more of your thing, uh, there's Mutants and Death Ray Guns, where you get to play as a gang of post-apocalyptic wasteland f survivors fighting other gangs, or just surviving the harsh monsters of the wasteland. Um, and this game works pretty well just about any post-apocalyptic thing, including a kind of Fallout setting. All of these games have similar requirements. Uh, you play them with the miniatures you want, glued to whatever bases you want, as long as they're individually based. And if you're using 15 millimeters or uh, something similar, you need to use a 24 by 24 inch play space. Uh, but if you're playing with miniatures that are closer to 28 millimeters, you'll generally need a 36 inch by 30 inch, 6 inch uh, table. All the movement ranges uh, use a short, medium, and long measuring stick, which is based on the scale of the miniatures you're using, and those are easy to make yourself. And you uh, only use normal six-sided dice, or D6 in the gamer parlance, uh, to play, and at most you're ever going to need is three of them. Your miniatures, usually called characters, have three stats, quality, combat, and then any special rules that you give them. 
Quality is all the intangible soldier qualities rolled into one. It's courage, skill, initiative, ability to see what's going on around you in the battlefield and then react to it. And it's usually the most important skill. It is represented in terms of 3 plus or 4 plus where you need to roll a number higher than that to succeed. Combat is the martial prowess of a character and special rules add flavor to your character so they play the way they're supposed to. Uh, as with many games, it's special rules that really make things start to be interesting. The central concept of the game is that in the fight, uh, there's friction keeping you from achieving the themes you want to achieve in a predictable manner. And the enemy is always looking for an opportunity to steal the initiative away from you. So instead of taking turns in a normal I go, you go format, uh, when it's a player's turn, uh, they get a chance to nominate a character to activate. And in certain conditions, if like if there's a leader present, they can do group activations. Uh, when a character activates, the player uh, has a choice to roll between one and three dice and compare that to their quality score. For every success that they roll, uh, they get an action, and then there are different rules for how you can spend those actions. Uh, for one failure, in some of the games, it lets the enemy try to react, and in all of the games, if you fail on two of your action dice, then it ends your turn, essentially, and it turns over to your opponent. This may sound crazy and a little counterintuitive, but when you're playing the game, it actually seems fairly natural, and the chaos and risk feel about right. So the game kind of simulates the fog of war and friction just by using this system rather than adding in rules and conditions uh, to deal with the, to handle the unknown and model all of that together. Combat is also very easy. Uh, both players roll a d6, add their combat score. The winner is usually uh, will usually force the loser to recoil or fall prone based on the dice. If the opponent doubles the score, then the loser goes out of action, and then if the score is tripled, you get what is called a gruesome kill, and all the allies around have to test morale. To allow you to get a taste for a game, I put together a small 100-point uh, bat rep, which is about a third or a fifth of the size of a real game of Songs and Blaine Heroes. Um, so I can kind of show you how the game works, and what it looks like when you play. Um, I have laid out here an example of everything you need to play. So you have the 3D6, you have different measuring sticks. Litco makes the cool measuring triangle you see there. So you can measure with all that. And you can use tokens if you want, but it's not a requirement. So here you have the two uh, parties that will be fighting each other. On the left you have a knight and two lovies, and on the right you have a small adventuring party with a fighter, mage, and a ranger. The knight has a quality of 3 plus and a combat of 3, and has the heavy armor, long move, and mounted special abilities. Both the lovies have a quality of 4 plus and a combat of 2, and they have the shooter short range ability. In the adventuring party, the fighter has quality of 3 plus and combat of 3 with heavy armor and short move. The mage has a quality of 4 plus and combat of 1 and has a magic user ability. Ignore the heavy armor and short move, that's a typo. And the ranger has quality of 4 plus and a combat of 2 and uses the forester, sharpshooter, and shooter long ability. In this game, actually, I used good shot instead of sharpshooter as the rules. Um, so that's something to be aware of whenever you watch the battle. The knight and the two levies deploy within one short of their side of the table, and then the adventuring party does the same. And then they dice off to see who gets to activate first, who has initiative. And this is the only time you competitively dice off to see who goes. In this case, the knight won, so that player gets to activate first and they selected the knight and they chose to roll two dice so they roll 2d6 and in this case they both ended up being a six. That compared to the quality of three plus means they have won two actions that they can spend. Um, in this case 
the player has chose to uh, spend their actions doing movement. Since the uh, character has the long move ability, that means they use the long movement stick uh, to do their movements. So they lay the stick down and they move the uh, miniature from one end to the other end of the uh, movement stick. And that's one movement action. And then they do the process again for their second movement action. And that ends that character's activation. The levy on the left also chooses to roll two dice to activate, but he fails one. He needs a four plus, and he got a six and a two. So with that one action, he chooses to move. Since this character does not have long move, he will use the medium movement stick in order to move, and he'll do it in the same way that the knight did, putting the character from one end to the other end of the movement stick. The uh, other levy on the right then act, rolls two dice to activate but fails both and this forces a turnover and the end of the knight's turn. The mage and the adventuring party try to activate on two dice but failed with both dice so the player's uh, turn immediately ended and play reverted back over to the knight. And here's the situation on the board after the first turn. So the levy that fumbled earlier has a chance to redeem himself. Uh, so he rolls two dice and gets one success and uses that for, to buy a move action and he advances forward to be online with his partner. Alright, so the levy on the left decides to try to activate with three dice and he rolls a six and two threes but he needed a four to uh, activate because he's quality four plus. So he does get one action, so he gets to spend that action, which is the six, and he does that with a move. But since he failed twice, once his action is over, play will go over to the other player, and the turn ends. The adventuring party uh, had enough success to where they can move up with their uh, ranger, uh, their wizard, who only rolls one dice, playing it safe. And then the fighter rolls all three dice because he's the last one to go anyway, and he gets to make four, uh, three short advances up since he has a short move ability, which means he uses a short movement stick when he moves. So for this player, the levy on the right is still trying to catch up, so he rolls two dice and gets both uh, successes. So that means he gets to buy two move actions, but he wants to move into the wood line. So in order to do that, he gets his first move, which is not in the wood line at all, which is a medium. But for his move that brings him into the wood line, he has to, d to downgrade that one level to make it a short move, as you see here. So the levy on the left uses two dice to activate and manages to succeed with both, and uses the first activation to move forward. The second activation uses to attack the fighter. So both characters roll a d6 and then they add their combat scores and any modifiers. The levy has a combat score of 2, but because he has shoot or short range and it takes two short range sticks to reach his target, he suffers a negative 1, so he only adds 1. And the fighter will add his full combat 3, so that will put him at a 7. So because of this, the levy loses the combat, but since he's making a range attack, there's no negative combat effect for him, just the fighter either dodges or blocks the attack and nothing else happens. And the knight ends the turn for uh, this side by rolling all three dice to activate and he moves some and this is the situation at the end of this turn. Uh, the ranger tries to activate and succeeds. Uh, he actually shoots but he doesn't actually achieve anything. And then the wizard activates uh, in this case, he fails, so he uses one action to withdraw a little bit, and then play switches back over to uh, the knight. The levy on the right advances forward, but doing so uh, forces a turnover, which ends up being alright because the ranger forces a turnover back, and that allows the levy to come up onto the hill along the flank of the adventuring party. And then the other levy uh, fumbles his activation, causing a turnover, and this is the situation at the end of this turn. 
So the ranger activates with uh, three dice, attempting to uh, get enough action points to get an aim action, increasing the probability of a kill against the enemy. Uh, however, he only succeeds on one action and the other two fail, so this forces a turnover. But he first does have an opportunity to get a shot off at his target, so he shoots the levy, but the levy seems to nimbly dodge it, and there's no effect, and play just transitions to back to the knight. The levy does manage to get two actions successfully, so that does allow him to spend one action point to aim. And when he attacks the ranger, he uh, overcomes him uh, narrowly, which uh, forces the uh, ranger to fall prone. Uh, he falls prone because the number on the attacker's die is even. If it would have been odd, it would have forced the uh, the losing character to move back one base width to recoil. Seeing his partner's success, the other levy rolls three dice, uh, but is less lucky, and gets one action, but um, forces a turnover with the other two failures. Uh, so he just moves closer so he'll be in range, but doesn't actually get to do anything this turn. So for the adventuring party, the mage activates on two dice and moves to the top of the hill and casts a spell, a magic attack, against the levee at the bottom of the hill. Uh, to no avail, uh, but this is a small time where you can talk about magic. In the basic system, magic is really easy, and the power of the spell is based on how many action points you put into it. And then you can either use it like a range attack, like a bow, uh, or you can use it to transvix the enemy. Um, and the range of those attacks is entirely based on the power level or how many actions you can put into that spell. Where brains and magic have failed, perhaps brute force and ignorance will succeed. So the fighter activates and gets two successful action points. So he uses that to move downhill in contact with the levy and defeat him in hand-to-hand -hand combat, forcing him prone. Alright, going back to the ranger who's prone. Uh, it's not good to be prone because if you lose uh, in combat when you're prone, you automatically go out of action. And you also are at a significant disadvantage when you fight. Um, to come out of prone, you have to activate successfully and spend one action point. So the ranger roll had a successful action and therefore was able to stand up and he's no longer prone. Alright, so with that, the knight will have a chance to activate, and he does successfully with two dice, and uses that to move into contact with the fighter, and engage him in close combat. Uh, since the knight is mounted, and he's fighting against a dismounted opponent, that gives him a plus one in combat, uh, but since the fighter is on an elevation, he also gets a plus one, so that essentially cancels out. So they both add their four to their... Um, die roll. The knight rolled six, so that makes ten for the knight, and the fighter rolled one, which makes five. Since the knight doubled the fighter's score, that means the fighter automatically goes out of action and is removed from the table. The levy on the right ro rolls three dice to activate and gets one success. Um, that ends up being enough because he uses that one to attack the uh, mage with his uh, range attack and with some lucky rolling uh, he manages to take out the mage uh, and that brings us to a special point that forces the enemy player to make a morale test. So you take morale tests at different times in Songs of Blade Heroes, usually associated with uh, special rules and abilities, but in all cases, you take one whenever the dead outnumber the living. So in the case of this adventuring party, uh, you have two dead characters and one living character, so the dead outnumber the living. So then you take a all the living characters left on the table take a morale test, and they do that by rolling three dice and compare it to their quality. Uh, for every failure, they have to run away that many directly towards the table edge. If they're off the table edge, they have fled, and if they don't 
if they end close or can't escape um, enemy models, they can be captured. Uh, this doesn't end the game um, directly, though it is a usually a substantial blow. Especially if you're in melee combat and you run away, you get a free hack, as it's called. Um, so, that's a morale. It's really simple. And in this case, the ranger ran off the table uh, because he failed on all of his dice. So that ends the battle with a resounding victory for the knight and his levies. Like I said at the beginning, this was a smaller battle. It was only 100 points, and normally in Song of Blaine Heroes, you'll play 300 to 500 points. Uh, what I have here are some pictures of uh, battles with uh, 300 points worth of miniatures to give you an idea of what that might look like. Um, so they take a little bit longer, and uh, plays a little bit easier whenever you have leaders who can coordinate grouped activations, uh, things get a little bit less spread out, and when you have different abilities and types of characters, it really changes up the game. So there are tons of ways you can play this game and enjoy it, and you can really build armies the way you want them to be built. I uh, hope this was informative for you. Honestly, every gamer should own a copy of Song of Blades Heroes, if for no other reason than when you uh, walk into a game store with your Circle of Orberus army from Hordes, and the only person there has a Mordheim or Shadespire Warband, then you two can play each other. The game is customizable enough where you can make your Warlocks and Warbeasts play like they do in Hordes, or you can have a band of maraudering adventurers like in Mordheim. And you can do this without having to buy anything else other than the book. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you will subscribe and keep an eye out for uh, my next video where I'll talk about how to make versatile, affordable, and easy to store terrain tiles like the ones you saw me use today. Uh, please comment below and tell me which of the settings for the different Songs of Blaine Heroes engines sounds most interesting to you. And if you have any questions about anything in this video, uh, you know how to ask. So till next time, be well.